everyone, I'm Vicki, and I want to welcome you to North Hills Church, especially if this is your first time joining us. We're going to get started in just a few minutes, but first, here's this week's Need to Know. On Saturday, April 13th, North Hills will be hosting the annual Living Joyfully Widows Conference. This is a community-wide event, so please stop by our welcome desk and take some invitations to share with your family, friends, and neighbors. We would love to bless as many women as possible. Our next LGBTQ forum is happening on April 29th. If you or someone you know is struggling with LGBTQ issues, or if you wanna learn how to talk about difficult questions with grace and truth, this forum is for you. Head to our website to register. Join us for our upcoming child safety training, Safe and Sound, on April 28th at 8.30 or 5 o'clock. This training focuses on the issues of child safety and the church and reviews our NHC child safety policies. All of our children's volunteers attend this training and we would like to make it available to our entire church family to participate. Please register on the website. You might remember a few weeks ago, Peter mentioned that the elders are reviewing our doctrinal statement. We want to invite all members to go to our website under the main menu, and you're going to see a place where you can click doctrinal statement review. Once you do that, we're inviting all members to reread our present doctrinal statement. We hope this will get us all onto the same page as we go throughout this process. That's all for now, but don't forget to listen to our podcast that takes a deeper dive into all things North Hills. You can listen on Apple, Spotify, and our website. Have a great week, everyone. Toodaloo, buckaroos. Good morning, church. Y'all stand with us and let's sing together to our Lord and King.
Good morning. Have a seat. It's my pleasure to welcome some of you for the first time. And many of you are back from last week, survived Easter. 2,500 people, Ryan tells us on the podcast, came through to worship. Praise God. And we're still on speaking terms, right? That's fantastic. Okay. Our culture tends to push us to being busy. If you're a man and you're not busy, something's wrong with you, right? And it just seems to say, on to the next thing. But this morning, I'd like for us to take a deep breath, slow down, and think about the Lord's Supper. Think back to that intimate scene in the upper room, Jesus and his disciples. The end is near. Jesus is very strategic and intentional about his use of time. And he knows human nature. We forget the important, don't we? We are easily distracted. So he, if you think about it, he creates a memory in the minds and the eyes of those disciples. I think they never got over. We want to talk about that a little bit. So let me read 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three to 26. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Think about the composure that Jesus demonstrated there. Totally present with those that he loved. He uses this common occurrence that we do eating a meal together. And he initiates and establishes a ceremony ensuring that his disciples remember him. He knows the next day they're going to be driving stakes through his hands. They're going to beat him and he's going to bleed to death. Yet he calmly sets up this memorial to himself. Imagine how he was suffering inside the turmoil. Yet he faces the brutal truth, my followers will be prone to forget me. And he knows how vital it is in our walk of faith to remember him. So he just says, when you eat this bread, think of my body that's given for you. When you drink from this cup, remember my blood. Incredible. So simple and so profound. Plus, on the very night he was betrayed, the scriptures say, he, we know about his suffering physically and spiritually, and yet sometimes we forget about emotionally. He was betrayed by Judas. It fulfills Psalm 41.9, my close friend in whom I trusted, the one who shared my food, has turned against me. Later, Peter will deny him. All will flee. I, as I thought about that this past week, I'm just astounded at the suffering Jesus endured. Hasn't he won our allegiance, our worship, our adoration? He certainly fought the good fight, didn't he? Right to the end. So let, it, let me just ask us all, let's not come to the Lord's Supper in a flippant way. Let's truly remember him. Think of all that he endured to provide us forgiveness of our sins. Let's take the time during the songs to really reflect on Jesus Christ. And as the folks come forward to give out the, the bread and the juice, If you're a follower of Christ, feel free to partake. And if you don't yet know him, 
just pass it along. But I would ask you to just ask yourself, how can I resist such love? And then when all are served, you're going to have some partners up here soon. When they're <laughs> and then when they're all served, uh, I'll come back up and uh, lead us and we'll partake together. Okay? You came down from heaven's throne. This earth you formed was not your home. And a love like this, the world had never known. A crown.
I'd like for us to do a little something different. Um, I'd like for us to express together verbally our heartfelt appreciation to the Lord for his sacrifice. So if you'd just repeat these words with after me. Lord Jesus, we remember you. Lord Jesus, we remember you. And thank you for dying for us. Thank you for dying for us. So let's Consider the bread, his body that was broken for us. Let's partake together. And let's take the, the juice. Let's consider together the blood of Jesus Christ that bought our forgiveness and partake together. Let me pray. Lord, I'm, I just say thank you, and it seems so weak, so much of an understatement. Lord, help my life to demonstrate how great you are. And I pray for Peter as he brings the word to us that we would respond to you not only with words but with our life that is like salt in the earth and like light to the dark to the people in darkness all around us and I ask this in Jesus name amen so just hang on to your cups and uh, there'll be trash cans at the exit when you leave let's continue to remember our risen Lord Ben's gonna lead us in some more songs yeah let's stand together <clears throat> I'm gonna teach you a chorus to an otherwise familiar song first service was ready to learn they said yes we're ready to learn <laughs> as one voice. Here's how the chorus goes, and we'll use it later. So it goes. Oh, come, come to the fountain. 
come and be satisfied. Oh, come, all who are thirsty, these waters will never run dry. These waters will never run dry. So we'll be ready. such a gift freedom forgiveness we wake up this morning swimming in your favor 
Because of Jesus, there is no wrath. We thank you. And we ask that your spirit would teach us now from your word what that looks like as, as this goes public, as such kindness fuels a different way of thinking and living in this world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> In the introduction to Jesus' most famous sermon, he begins by describing his citizens, the citizens of this kingdom, as blessed, over and over again, blessed, favored, the unlikely ones, the poor in spirit. The ones who have mourned, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And, and these unique qualities don't lead to applause, they actually lead to inevitable persecution, verses 10 through 12 of Matthew 5. But Jesus ends this introduction to his most famous sermon by communicating two vivid images, salt and light. Like if you want to know what these blessed ones are like, this, this is where he ends. You are the salt of of the earth, verse 13. Now, what, what does this mean? It's, it's not an easy question to answer. One website suggests that there are over 14,000 uses of salt. Today, we take salt for granted. But in ancient times, it was coveted and necessary for life, like whole towns at certain places were built near salt licks. In ancient Greece, salt was traded for slaves, which is where the expression came. He's not worth his salt. Roman soldiers were paid salt money, salarium argentums, which is where we get the word salary. So every time you make a salary, you're literally earning salt. There's been a long-standing superstition that spilled salt is a bad omen. You get a glimpse of this in the painting by Leonardo da Vinci, The Last Supper. If you look really closely, right next to the right arm of Judas, you see a bowl of spilt salt. Battles have been fought over salt. In 1777, Lord Howe captured General Washington's salt supply. Salt has been a, condu a condiment. It's been used at, for toothaches or a means of paying taxes. Newborn babies still in some countries are rubbed down with salt. Now, let's bring this down a little bit from 14,000 uses to Three possible interpretations as to what Jesus means. You are the salt of the earth. Number one, salt calls attention to God's covenant faithfulness. Like in Leviticus 2.13, you shall season all your grain offerings with salt. You shall not let the salt of the covenant with your God be missing from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. So the salt of the covenant is the permanence of the covenant. Christians are to the earth what salt is to the offering, communicating the durability, dependability, covenantal faithfulness of God. Number two, salt brings out the best in society. Salt is a flavoring, even in the ancient world, a fertilizing 
element. An illustration of this could be seen in Colossians 4, 6. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how, to, how you ought to answer each person. So as, as grace-filled speech seasons communication by keeping it from becoming tasteless, so followers of Jesus season life on earth. So Christians in this view are, are a purifying, transforming influence on society. That's the positive side. The negative of that same point could be described as salt, number three, preserves society from corruption and decay. So it not only promotes the best, but prevents the worst. Roman historian Josephus mentioned a town on the edge of the Sea of Galilee. He called it uh, Tarche, and it's most likely he's referring, that's a Roman name for the, the city of Magdala, which is where Mary of Magdala, Mary of Magdalene came from. Uh, but what's interesting is the Roman name for that town literally means, that word means salty fish. So we know that the disciples would have been very familiar with the pickling, preserving qualities of salt. So if you take all those various views, these benefits that Christianity brings to society is the reason why atheist Richard Dawkins last weekend got into a heap of trouble. Um, because he expressed concerns about the 30,000 lights that were hung in Oxford Street, on Oxford Street, London, to celebrate Ramadan on Easter weekend. And in an interview with LBC on Sunday, Dawkins said this. So this is just last Sunday. I must say I am slightly horrified to hear that Ramadan is being promoted instead of Easter. I feel that we are a Christian country. <laughs> now, anybody who knows Dawkins is gasping. Like, he went on to call himself a cultural Christian. Now, if you, anyone who's read his book, The God Delusion, back in 2006, would be shocked by this statement, because if you're not familiar with Richard Dawkins, he's perhaps, he's one of the, uh, out of four, most famous atheists in the world. He is fanatically an atheist, he is evangelistically an atheist, and yet he calls himself a cultural Christian? What is he talking about? Well, what's interesting about that interview is that he is saying almost, and this is, brace yourself, he's saying almost the same thing as Jesus is saying. Like, a little different. He, he doesn't want anyone to actually be a Christian. But he wants the benefits of Christianity. Like, when he looks at the rise in England of Islam, so much so that Easter is replaced in some areas with Ramadan, as an atheist, and he considers the change that will come about to his country, the influence of Islam, or even his own non-religion religion, atheism, he will pick, he'll pick Christianity. Why? Well, he knows that when Christianity, the influence of Christianity disappears, the basis for his society evaporates. Like any kind of human equality, justice, love, compassion, all of, all of that, human rights, are grounded in in the Christian faith. And so, 
what he's getting at, obviously Jesus is going beyond this, not just the benefits, but the reality, it is really what I believe we, if we need to get our arms around, what is Jesus saying here regarding salt and light? It is that Christians, followers of Jesus, benefit the world. That's it. That's what Jesus is truly highlighting. The world may hate, mock, persecute Christians, but Christians will benefit. Christians will bring out the best in society. So how do we do that? We benefit the world as we are viable, visible, Valuable vertical. Viable, visible, valuable. I've never used V's before. So, <laughs> so new day at North Hills. Uh, what I'm trying to do is get our arms around what is he saying about salt and light? Because I think it's the same point coming at it from different angles. Let's walk through those four. Um, we benefit the world as we are, number one, viable. Now, to be viable is to do, to be and do what you say you are and do, like to perform as intended. Look what Jesus says in verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Now, salt or sodium chloride in its pure form is extremely stable. It it can't become unsalty. But in the day before refineries, salt was often mixed with other minerals like carnalite, gypsum, And could become so contaminated as to be useless. That's what Jesus is getting at. That it might claim to be salt, but it is so mixed up with other minerals that it has lost its saltiness and therefore is fit just to be thrown away. Now, notice Jesus is saying that an unsalty Christian is not a neutral commodity, but a liability. That's, it's very strong words. Now, how does that work? Well, think about what's going on today in our culture. Things are changing extremely fast. Like you look at both political parties, are morphing at an extremely fast rate. They're changing in different ways, but they're both changing. Think about how our culture is viewing who we are as human beings. The meaning of marriage is morphing at a, an extremely fast rate. What it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, everything's up for grabs, but What's interesting, if you're tuned into history, you realize that even though the names are different, a lot of the changes that are occurring today were in Greece, were in Rome, they're just on repeat. So in some, and the church thrived in those contexts. So what you begin to realize is the greatest threat to the church today is not the culture we live in. That has always changed will always change, has no foundation, and therefore is always going to be in flux. The greatest challenge is what Jesus is getting at. It's when churches and pastors and Christians who claim to be followers of Jesus cease to truly follow him and begin to mimic the world. That's when we're in trouble. And that's what Jesus is saying. It's so-called salt that has lost its viability. It's it's not salty. It's just mirroring, mimicking the culture around it. And therefore, it literally serves no purpose. Why do you need it? 
if it's just aping the culture it exists in. A couple years ago, Ben Sixsmith, a journalist, wrote this. He said, I am not religious, so it is not my place to dictate to Christians what they should and should not believe. Still, if someone has a faith worth following, I feel that their beliefs should make me feel uncomfortable for not doing so. If they share 90% of my lifestyle and values, then there is nothing especially inspiring about them. Instead of making me want to become more like them, it looks very much as if they want to become more like me. Douglas Murray, very much not a Christian, perhaps agnostic, said in an interview a couple years ago to with Justin Brierley, he said, my fear is the church is not doing what so many of us on the outside would like it to do, which is to be preaching its gospel, to be asserting its truths and its claims. When one sees it falling into all the latest tropes, what's a trope? Like He's using it here as like all the latest cultural cliches. One just thinks, well, there's another thing gone. It's like absolutely everything else in this boring, monotone, ill-thought-out, and shallow dialectic. <laughs> it's a real positive guy. <laughs> but what he's getting at is when, when Christians are just like everyone else, we've lost our reason to exist. Like, why do we need more of what isn't working? Jesus said in verse 13, good to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. But so many of us, our greatest fear is to be thought of as different, weird, that we aren't like everyone else. And of course, if we're just being weird to be jerks, then yeah, we should be concerned about that. But that, that's not what Jesus is talking about. When we are with Jesus, and we are like Jesus, and we are known as people who follow Jesus, not some political leader, not some cultural movement, whichever direction, but those are the Jesus people. We, we are viable. Like we are who we claim to be. We're not going to be perfect. We're going to mess up, and the world is going to mock us and misunderstand us and misrepresent us. Don't think that if you do this, everybody's going to applaud. No. But we benefit the world when we are, number one, viable. When we are who we say we are. Second, we benefit the world when we are visible. Now here Jesus is switching from salt to light, but I believe he's getting at the same point. Look at verse 14. You are the light of the world. And that's emphatic in the original. And it's quite a remarkable statement when you consider the fact that without Jesus, we were darkness. Not just lived in darkness, we were darkness. We lived in darkness. We love darkness. If we had a choice between being open and honest, we'll stay in the shadows. We'll try to get people to think things about us that are not true. We practiced works of darkness. But with Jesus, our hearts become full of light. We become children of light. We put on armor of light. We become lights in a dark world. And this quick digression here, because that, that reference there, Philippians 2.15, so interesting. Paul says there, we will be lights in a dark world if we are not disputing and grumbling. 
Now think about that. You want to be salt and light tomorrow at work? You could start one simple thing. Don't complain. And people would be like, whoa, what's wrong with this person? Like, don't be characterized by grumbling and disputing. And you will shine brightly. The bar is low, folks. <laughs> yeah, we can start there. That's what Philippians 2.15 is all about. Now, here Jesus uses two illustrations to communicate our visibility. One is a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. A couple of years ago, my wife and I were at the Sea of Galilee. And we, this is my wife walking on the Sea of Galilee. <laughs> do, do not be deceived. It is our skillful, skillful camera work. Um, <clears throat> but if you look across the Sea of Galilee at night, and this is not far from where this sermon, where Jesus taught this sermon. So when he talks about a city set on a hill cannot be hidden, in their minds, they're thinking about, like, looking. They can see the Sea of Galilee from where he's teaching. They're look, looking across. Now, of course, that city's a little brighter today because of electricity, just a wee bit. But whether it's oil lamps or electric lamps, when you have light in a dark place, especially up on a hill, Jesus is simply saying, it can't be hidden. Second illustration, he says, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket or a bowl, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. Now, he's just using a little basic logic there, why would you spend money on valuable oil to light a lamp and then cover it up? Doesn't make sense. So why would God transform our lives from darkness to light simply to be covered up? Doesn't make sense. As Bonhoeffer says, flight into the invisible is a denial of the call. The community of Jesus which seeks to hide itself has ceased to follow him. Jesus presses this home to our hearts by emphasizing verse 16 in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see. Notice the connection between visibility and proximity. We have to live close enough to the lost so they can see the light. Around 33 years ago when our church started, I was running a business. So every day I was interacting with people who worked for me and we did jobs for who did not know Jesus. So living and giving the gospel was a very natural daily experience. But I noticed as the church grew and as I went full-time ministering more and more with and to Christians, over time you can become isolated from those who don't know Jesus. And it was a little over 20 years ago we were studying this passage and the Spirit really spoke to my heart, my wife's heart, and we made some intentional choices to live, to shine our light before others. And I'm not going to go through those because what I don't want to communicate that you need to do what we did. No, we're all going to do this different. But the point is, we're all called to shine our lights before others. I remember praying with our kids when they were little based on this passage and James 1.27 Two things every day, like many days, to, sh to shun and to shine. 
to shun, not people, but shun the world, like James 1.27 says, keep yourself unstained from the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Every day, Christians are doing those two things, shunning and shining, which in James 1.27 is to minister, visit orphans and widows, like, or in the context of this passage, it is retain your saltiness but radiate the light of Jesus. So we're, we're shunning and shining. Many of us are good at one or the other. We're good at shunning or shining. And in one case, we isolate others and retain our holiness. In the other case, we blend in and become no different. Jesus is calling us to do both. And you can see this in our church purpose. Notice how it moves from inside out as we believe God's word. It's what we're doing right now. We're sitting under the authority of God's word as we gather as life groups, as we wake up in the morning. We're first and foremost, we're with Jesus, hearing him, receiving what he has for us. He, by his spirit, is transforming us into his image. But then we're also connecting with his family. We're not, there's no such thing as a lone Christian. We're doing this together. But then we're radiating out as we share his story. So we're with Jesus, with one another, and then with the lost. We benefit the world as we are viable, visible. And the third one is valuable. And what I mean by that, you'll see in verse 16, so that they may see your good works. Barclay points out there are two Greek words for good, two primary. Agathos, which is good in character. And then kalos, which is good in quality, but also in appearance. So it's good in the sense of winsome, beautiful, attractive. Now, this can be super difficult. How do we live out uncompromising goodness in a way that our lost neighbors might find appealing? The early church wrestled with this. Like, this is the question. What does it mean to be salt and light? Life in the Roman Empire could be extremely difficult. Dr. Rodney Stark, in his book, The Rise of Christianity, describes just one city, Antioch, which was not far from where the Apostle Paul grew up. Any accurate portrait of Antioch in New Testament times, Rodney Stark writes, must depict a city filled with misery, danger, fear, despair, and hatred. A city where the average family lived a squalid life in filthy and cramped quarters, where at least half of the children died at birth or during infancy. Now just pause for a second. Imagine that. How many kids do you have? Half of them not living through childhood. And where most of the children who lived lost at least one parent before reaching maturity. A city filled with hatred and fear, rooted in intense ethnic antagonisms and exacerbated by a constant stream of strangers. A city so lacking in stable networks of attachments that petty incidents could prompt mob violence. A city where crime flourished and the streets were dangerous at night. And perhaps above all, a city repeatedly smashed by cataclysmic catastrophes where a resident could expect literally to be homeless from time to time, providing that he or she was among the survivors. Now, in this context of disease, poverty, crime, calamity, Christians became known for their beautiful sacrificial works. The church thrived in this city. 
As Shanti Felton summarizes Stark's analysis of Christianity in the first two centuries with these words, Stark was puzzled at how a marginalized, persecuted, often uneducated group of people were able not only to survive, but thrive. He concludes that a key reason was their willingness to sacrifice themselves out of love for each other and for their world. This sacrifice released an explosion of light and heat the world had never known. Let me give you one example. In an article in Christian History, Dr. Stark described how Christians responded to two of the great plagues, there were many more, that wiped out a third of the population. A.D. 165 and A.D. 251, the willingness of Christians to care for others was put on dramatic public display. Pagans tried to avoid all contact with the afflicted, often casting the still living into the gutters. Christians, on the other hand, nursed the sick, even though some died doing so. Christians also were visible and valuable during the frequent natural and social disasters afflicting the Greco-Roman world. Earthquakes, famines, floods, riots, civil wars, and invasions. Even in healthier times, the pagan emperor Julian noted the followers of the way, that's what he called them, the followers of the way, support not only their poor, but ours as well. We benefit the world as we are viable, visible, valuable, and then finally vertical, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So we are vertical in the sense of Christians benefit the world when we know what to do with glory. It all goes up. <laughs> not out, not back. Up. And this is not easy. Uh, years ago, uh, I had a neighbor, an older couple, who I built a relationship with. He was agnostic. She was Buddhist. And there were so many times when I was over their house helping them with a project when he would go from mockery to flattery. Like, his wife was more responsive to the gospel, so we'd be out working in the yard, and she would be asking great, great questions. I'm sharing the gospel with her, and he's heckling. <laughs> Super helpful. <laughs> and then, a few minutes later, he would be describing the horrible things he's done in life, and I, I'm so bad, Peter. You're so good. And it's like, yes, David, you are bad. And I'm bad. And this is the thing about the gospel. is there's no room for glory to go anywhere but up. It's like we're in this together, neighbor. Like I am as messed up as you are. And you're right, you are bad. And not in a Michael Jackson sense of bad. <laughs> but like you're bad. And I'm bad. But he's good. And so whatever we're doing... All the glory goes back to our Father. We benefit the world when we live that way. That's what, what I mean by vertical. Making sure all the glory goes back to our Father in heaven. So, what does this look like in the day-to-day? -day? I've been asking some of you over the past few weeks, just not a formal scientific study, but just randomly what do you think it means to be salt and light? And I want to share one response, and then I want to just give some examples, snippets of what some of our people are doing. And I'm going to leave the names out because my purpose, again, is not to say if you're really spiritual, you're going to do it exactly like these people. 
But what I pray is that our imaginations would be stimulated to see both how God is using us to do this right now and also how we can grow. So one example, uh, this is a single young man in our church. I asked him, what does it mean to you to be salt and light? And this was his email response. This is just a part of it. I try to keep myself located within God's grand story rather than the busyness of the moment. When I have Christ and our glorious inheritance in mind, it allows me to lay aside any pressure that may come from the immediate. With that said, when I talk with others, I try to find and highlight things that Christians and non-Christians would agree are good, true, and beautiful. For example, rather than getting into a political discussion about the state of our communities, I try to embark on conversations like, what makes a good community? Many of the answers my non-Christian friends and coworkers give, like strong communal feel, courtesy for neighbors, actual personalized help for those in need, educational and economic opportunity for everyone, trustworthy leaders, are in line with and come from Christianity. From here, I can agree with them and show how the heart of God and the gospel lines up with these ideas. It allows me to highlight ways that Christian churches and ministries are addressing these needs. And sometimes, most importantly, I can grieve with them that so many of these things are non-existent in our community. These conversations, this is really big, these conversations require thinking long term. I'm not trying to win an argument or assert my way in a conversation. I want to show them how many things they value line up with the gospel and help them see God's heart for humanity. Often they are incredibly surprised. He goes on to emphasize how important it is to be honest how important it is to be willing to say, I don't know. Which I think that paralyzes a lot of us, right? We're afraid if I get in a conversation with this person, they might ask me a question, I don't know. It's okay to say, I don't know. I, I, I want to think about that. And to be vulnerable. Like to be honest about our own struggles. And then he concludes this way. My goal is that I interact with them in a way that they trust me enough to ask another question in the future. When I interact with somebody in public, I want their day to be better because they interacted with me. Even if it's simply a smile and a hello, I think God can move in the simplest of things. Imagine if Christians were known as the kindest, most interested people, even if they are a bit weird. That that combination is huge. Embrace your weirdness, okay? Like, you believe, if you're a believer, you believe Jesus rose from the dead. That is the craziest thing in the world. Once you embrace that, it's fine from there on out. All all the weirdness is is good. Uh, Let me give you a couple other examples a retired couple, and these are people in our church, serving refugees by taking them to doctor appointments, teaching English, being available to help. This is, they've been doing this for 10 years. A young couple hosting a Spanish Bible study in their home, teaching ESL, tutoring, playing soccer, looking for opportunities to invite people to experience the love of Jesus. A retired man volunteers in Kid Stuff on Sunday Literacy on Tuesdays, Good News Club on Wednesday, which is not easy. Numerous men consistently volunteering at church and in the community, helping single moms and widows with home repairs and projects. Speaking of widows, Laura Baker and her volunteer team will be serving widows here at our church April 13th all day. If you know a widow who could be encouraged, Or if you would like to volunteer to help, you can jump on the need to know. Around 10 people gather each month 
month here to make 125 meals, and a team of around 10 people take these meals to the homeless and seek to love them well in Jesus' name. Also throughout the year, supplies are provided for the homeless. This is the part I struggle with giving these examples because for every example I just gave you, I could give 20, 30, 40, 50 more. Doctors, nurses, loving their patients well, looking for opportunities to pray for or with them, teachers, students, lawyers, plumbers, electricians, using their skills for the common good to the glory of God. Many of you holding neighborhood Bible study. You know, one thing I've been thinking about with vocation is some of us think if you get paid, it can't count as salt and light. Do you think that? Like, no, that's my job. Well, that, that's what you're spending a big part of your life doing. How about, what, what would happen if just a little shift occurred and you realized that's one of the ways God is using me as salt and light for the common good? I mean, unless you're selling illegal drugs. <laughs> like, what, what if God is calling you to shine as salt and light by being an honest contractor, electrician, a, a teacher, what, whatever it is, to, to do what you do well for the glory of God as a follower of Jesus. If, if you're not sure where to begin, we have a great class coming up, a life ed class called The Art of Neighboring. And it's full of great videos and very concrete examples as to how you can start just by those around you. Like when I drive around Greenville and see all the apartment complexes going up, all the new homes, and I know some of you are like, all oh, these people are jamming our roads. <laughs> <laughs> and it can make you mad. Or what if... You're living as salt and light and imagine, Lord, you're going to call some of us to move into those apartment complexes, to start Bible studies, to radiate your love, just to be a kind neighbor. This class is real basic and real practical, so look for more announcements. You can, uh, you can sign up for that class. Uh, Beth Milborn uh, in our church was kind enough to make these stickers. So I trimmed mine a little and put it on my phone if you want to be as spiritual as me. <laughs> wow! Um, but it's just a little reminder. At, as, as you walk out uh, in a little bit, uh, feel free to grab one. If you're not going to use it, do, please don't take one, but if you would like one as a reminder, it can, be, it can be helpful. Let's pray. Father, as we prayed last night, maybe the biggest thing for some of us right now is, is we, we need you to open our eyes to how you're already using us. Some of us have this feeling like we never can do enough and it's never right enough and it's, it can be so paralyzing. So I, I pray that you would open our eyes. There are just hundreds and hundreds of examples in our church family of your followers bringing kindness into their neighborhoods, opening their homes, baking a, a pie, listening to someone going through a struggle, doing quality work. Lord, open our eyes to what you are doing and then expand our vision. The, the darker things get in our culture, Lord, it, it's the more you're calling us to radiate your light. 
may we be the kind of church that if North Hills disappeared tomorrow, our neighbors would be sad. That if Christians were not in a particular hospital or business or school or neighborhoods, apartment complexes, that, that people would notice. Lord, help us receive that not as some kind of threat or crushing burden, but an exciting vision for us to be viable, for us to be who you've made us to be, for us to be visible and radiate your light, valuable in the kind of works that we do and vertical in the glory we give you, that we would be a people not characterized by grumbling about all the bad things that are happening, which there are plenty and there always have been and will be, but we are a people who give thanks And it makes a difference. And Lord, if someone here doesn't know you, may this be the morning when they put their faith in you. Thank you, Lord, for all you're doing. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's respond in worship. You can stand. And um, there'll be people up front if if you say, I really don't know where to begin, or I'm deeply burdened about a particular coworker or friend, or, or I just want wisdom, there, there'll be a prayer team up here who would be happy to pray with you now or after. Uh, let's cry out to him. your armor on, hear the call of Christ our captain, for now the weak can say that they are strong in the strength that God has given, with shield of faith and belt of truth, we'll stand against the devil's lies, an army bold whose battle cry is lost. Reaching out to those in darkness. Our call to war, to love the captive soul, but to rage against the captor. And with the soul that makes the wounded whole, we will fight with faith and love. Yeah. 
shall see. So Spirit, come, put strength in every stride. Give grace for every hurdle that we may run with faith to win the prize of a servant good and faithful. As saints of old still line the way, retelling triumphs of His grace, we hear their calls and hunger for the day when with Christ we stand in doesn't need your good works your neighbor does 
what he's trying to capture is the fact that we as followers of Jesus, we're not doing good works to try to earn salvation or perform or prove something, impress anyone. Christ has done it all. As we began our service, with, we are washed, we are clean, we are forgiven, we are loved with a, a love like no other love. And then out of that love, though, our neighbors, they don't know that kind of love. So God doesn't need your good works. Your neighbor does. So just imagine this group of people going into all our various schools, hospitals, places of employment, businesses, neighborhoods with the love and light of Jesus. Go in peace. Ha, ha, ha.